Hello everyone. Uh, in the previous lecture on strain energy, uh, we had obtained this expression that sigma ij is equal to del u naught del epsilon ij and after obtaining this expression we had uh, posed the question whether it is possible to obtain this kind of a, an expression for the epsilon ij, a counterpart expression for the epsilon ij in terms of the sigma ij. So we had ended with this motivating question. So the answer is yes, it is possible to find such an uh, expression and such a rela relation. Uh, and the answer, of course, is what this uh, this complementary energy is. So uh, what we are going to do is we are going to uh, answer this question uh, in a slightly uh, mathematically abstract way. Uh, what we are going to do is we are going to ex to uh, to define a complementary energy density. We are going to uh, define it to this expression. So this u naught with a dash that is the complementary energy density, and we are going to define it in this fashion. Now, just written outright like this. It, uh, it may seem a little bit alien, but the idea behind this is something very general mathematically, which is actually referred to as the legendary transformation. Okay, so it is not just in the context of this kind of, uh, of a complementary energy density that we, that we come up with legendary transformation, rather uh, in, in many different areas, in, uh, for example, in thermodynamics, uh, uh, as well as in other areas, we, uh, when we are deriving these kinds of mathematical frameworks where we wish to find out these kinds of counterpart expressions, we, we appeal to the use of, uh, of the legendary transformation. All right, so, uh, so how can we, uh, so, so what, do we, what we want to prove here, uh, to prove that uh, this indeed provides us with the answer that we are seeking here. So we wish to show or we wish to prove that epsilon ij is equal to del u naught dash del sigma ij. This is what we want to prove. So let's uh, see if we can indeed prove this. So we'll start with this expression. And very naively, we'll proceed by just trying to take the partial derivative of this left hand side with respect to uh, sigma ij. So basically, we're just going to write down this. So on the right hand side, similarly, we have to carry out the partial derivative. Now for this, because we have two terms multiplied, we are going to use the chain rule to break them apart. So All right. Next, we note that so the left hand side it doesn't undergo any change, but this uh, right hand side we can do a little bit of manipulation for this first term and write it in this fashion. Uh, Now, please note that what I have written here is quite illegal in the sense of uh, in the sense of the index notation as we have learned in our applied elasticity. So, what I should actually do is 
Let's write down this epsilon ij in terms of the pq. All right. Now this term, so this is the kind of term which we have encountered previously in our discussions of applied elasticity. And the answer to it is simply obtained by noting that uh, we, can, we can use the substitution power of the Kronecker delta to, uh, to obtain uh, this. So this is, okay. Now this epsilon pk remains as it is, pq remains as it is, and this term also remains as it is. Okay, so I need to make a little bit of space here. Uh, let me see if I can do that quickly. I think that should do it. All right. So continuing, uh, this particular thing, uh, you please note that it is exactly in this form del u naught del epsilon ij except that in place of ij i have pq so this can be written as minus sigma pq this uh, part just remains as it is plus this uh, p gets substituted by this i and this q gets substituted by this j so i have epsilon ij and plus, of course, this term, which, which remains as it is. And now you can see that this last term, this first term, it cancels this last term. So overall, what we are going to have is that this thing is just going to be equal to epsilon ij. If I write that in my next uh, page, tell u dash del sigma ij is equal to epsilon ij. So this is what we had to prove and we have, we have just proved it. Okay, so hence proved. Now, what is the implication of this? So uh, all this talk about the Lagendre transformation and the, and the rewriting uh, of the expressions is fine mathematically, but uh, uh, what is the usefulness of this? Well, you see, uh, what we have just described in terms of the complementary energy, that is exactly what is going to lead us to a discussion of the all-important theorem uh, of Castigliano. Uh, and I say all-important because the main activity which will result from this all these uh, sophisticated, rather sophisticated discussions of this energy methods where, where we are bringing together mechanics, uh, concepts from thermodynamics and uh, so many other mathematical things. Uh, ultimately, uh, we wish to solve uh, uh, certain problems uh, using these energy methods and we will see that the ultimate basis of those will be the use of this uh, complementary energy. To the, to of course, the application of the Castiglianos theorem, which we'll be discussing sometime later. Now, uh, before we go into those sorts of discussions, uh, uh, I, I, I wish to point out uh, one important thing. So you see, uh, we have motivated this definition of the complementary energy in a purely mathematical fashion. Okay, so what we did in the previous slide here, uh, by appealing to the Logendre transformation, we have defined this thing, and then it just so happened that we, we were able to prove what, what we wanted to, what, what the kind of expression that we wanted to have here. Uh, but in certain textbooks, uh, none of this is presented like this. Okay, the complementary energy is discussed in a slightly different fashion by, uh, by, by taking recourse to the stress strain relation rather the the plot associated with the stress strain so what is done is something like this 
that uh, in those textbooks they they draw or they show uh, this kind of a uh, stress strain relationship first of all okay something like this so you understand that this is a linear relationship between sigma and epsilon uh, so this is basically just uh, Hooke's law uh, and what they do is they say that if you if you consider this zone okay if you consider this zone so this is basically what is the, the strain energy density of course i have written it like u not uh, but you understand that this is uh, the, the strain energy density and what they say is that the counterpart of this area okay so if you to drop a horizontal from this point on this vertical axis then this area that is given by u naught dash now of course for such a kind of linear relationship uh, you understand that this is basically a rectangle and this is a diagonal so this area is perfectly equal to this area so of course for such a linear relationship this u naught and u naught dash are perfectly equal and of course in those textbooks they also go on to say that uh, suppose we did not have such a linear relationship then also the same ideas would hold suppose we had such a kind of a non-linear relationship between sigma and epsilon then uh, this part would still continue to be the strain energy density this would still be the strain energy density and the counterpart of this so this would continue to be the, the complementary energy density and they of course point out that in such a case as you as it is clearly evident here that u naught is not equal to u naught dash uh, for the nonlinear stress strain relationship now such a uh, such a uh, visual depiction is very appealing to our understanding but uh, there is a problem here the problem is that this kind of a uh, discussion to motivate the, the discussion of the complementary energy or to introduce this, uh, the complementary energy density is a little bit problematic because uh, these kinds of visual depiction is only and only applicable for one dimensional problems. So what I mean to say is that uh, only when you have the uh, a problem such that only one component of strain and one component of stress is important okay so maybe for a very slender rod which is under uniaxial tension so for such kind of problem uh, this may be all right this kind of discussion but for a general enough problem where you have multiple components of stresses and strains uh, contributing then this visual depiction simply breaks down we cannot have such a such a naive and a simplistic kind of description it is good for a general uh, for a very uh, very uh, general kind of introductory uh, motivating example but this cannot be a, a general uh, discussion of the topic of complementary energy that is why it is important to really appeal to the general mathematical legendary transformation and to to proceed from there okay uh, nevertheless uh, there are some important lessons that we can uh, extract out of even this simplistic uh, thing which is to say that uh, when we are solving problems you will see that uh, indeed when our constitutive behavior that is the relation between stresses and strains is linear uh, then uh, it really does not matter whether we consider the complementary energy density or the strain energy density however if our relationship is non-linear then we simply have to be very very careful with considering this kind of a complementary energy 
uh, complementary energy density. Okay, so we'll see the applications. We'll see the we'll see first of all the development of the Castiglione's theorem, and then uh, we'll also very much discuss the uh, discuss the solution of certain problems, uh, both linear as well as nonlinear, uh, based on on the on the Castiglione's theorem. All right. So on that note, I'll end this lecture. Thank you very much.